Hello everybody, uh, it's Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in on you. Look, uh, before I get started, a reminder, uh, we are in the middle of a fundraiser for the Odyssey Project, uh, and specifically a targeted fundraiser for uh, Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage initiative along with wraparound services for black males ages 4 through 30. Uh, everything from the rite of passage all the way through mental health resources, skills training, and so much more. And with that out of the way, uh, let me get to what I want to talk to you about for as long as I have it in me. Disclaimer, at this particular point right now, at this very moment, I am completely emotionally drained combination of what I deal with every day uh, within the black community. Uh, you know, number one, my job is helping people become better. A lot of times I'm dealing with people who are struggling with different forms of trauma and are in need of healing and intervention, and that takes its toll. Uh, but the great deal of my emotional strain comes from the work I do in the community, specifically, and the work I do with the increasing number of black men and black boys that are brought to me, predominantly under the age of 25. Um, and it's a lot. I'm gonna be very careful in my wording because I don't want to betray the trust of the people who need my help. Uh, and even though I'm not giving their names, they still may feel betrayed if they hear any specific details about what it is they're facing and going through. So I'm going to be careful with that. And I'm gonna focus on one thing that I'm not directly involved with, at least not now. <clears throat> I am consistently talking about the need for us to support programs in the black community of people and organizations like myself who are committed to being hands-on and engaged and aware with their fingers on the pulse of the need of the community. Uh, I think that we have been raped and pillaged. We gave in excess of 100 million to Black Lives Matter and come to find out we were, we were grifted. Uh, they're not the only ones. United Way uh, and so many others take from us because they have the 5013C uh, designation and it seems official and all of the other stuff, but they're not putting in the work. They're not in the community. If you're in the community, you would know they're not in the community. If you're doing the work, you'll know they're not helping. Uh, a lot of that goes to administration cost salaries and so much more. I've done a report on just how much money raised goes to salaries, especially of the high level executives within the United Way, for instance. And it's no different across the board, Red Cross and so many others. Yet, uh, when it comes time to supporting organizations who actually put in work, it's, it's, it's rough selling. It's rough selling. Uh, the reason I'm emotionally drained is it's been a rough couple of weeks for me. Uh, just fighting. I mean, you know, uh, I've got kids with suicidal ideations. I've got kids uh, who are self-harming. I've got kids who are a threat to others. Um, I've got females who are recovering from abuse in every way imaginable. I mean, all the way up into their 60s. I've got incest victims that are still struggling with something that happened 50 years ago. Today, I find out that in DeKalb County, Georgia, an 11-year-old black male name, uh, I think his last name is Johnson. I don't know if they gave his first name or if Johnson is his last name. He just kept saying Johnson, but it was brought to my attention 
because you know people always come to me with, to, for, for assistance and help with trying to make sense of things that don't make sense. 11 years old, shot in the head at a skating ring. His family believes he was literally targeted. Who in the hell targets an 11 year old? But he is in an induced coma, medically induced coma, hoping to save his life. We don't know what the outcome will be, even if his life is saved. We're talking about being shot in the head. And, you know, my prayers go out to the family. And I was just, you know, sharing with one of my partners. She and I are going to do a live on trauma on Thursday evening. And... We were talking about whether or not it's a wrap for us as a as a race of people, in, in, at least in this country. Is it it's, it is it a wrap? I remember uh, having a strong disagreement with Dr. Claude Anderson when he and his wife Joanne reviewed my blueprint for Black empowerment. They were so excited about it. I think his wife Joanne really loved it because of how much credit I gave him for certain parts of it that had to do with economics and things of that nature. Um, and But there was one thing that he kept saying is that we had already reached a point. It, it was always his prediction that by 2013 we would become a permanent underclass in this country. I didn't want to accept that. I didn't want to accept that we were permanently defeated and that there was no way that we could come up as a race of people in this country. I am reaching a point, I am rapidly approaching a point where I'm really truly questioning uh, whether or not maybe he was right because I'm looking at it getting worse. And even in this, the, the article that I read that was sent to me was on B. Scott, which is a black owned uh, paper. Rest in peace, B. Uh, again, you're going to have to work with me. Uh, even in the way that the story is told and the way that the story is headed, it speaks to a problem of ours. And I read something in uh, a video I posted earlier today where I read from, it's excerpts from three different books that I've written. Uh, my 19th book, Born in Captivity, my 22nd book, uh, The Undoing of an African American Mind, and my 24th book, Academic Apartheid. And I allude to a number of different things uh, when, when I'm talking about this, but the thing is, I talk real big about identity and the importance of identity and that we're in identity crisis. And what happens when we're in identity crisis? Well, in this heading, they kept saying black boy. Now they knew his name. But they said, kept saying black boy, they kept referring to black boy. And people say, well, he's a black boy. Why isn't that a problem? And when we're talking about black boys, as a general, I have no problem with it. When we're talking about a specific person that we know his name, I think it's important to speak his name. But the fact that we are uh, uh, referring to him as a black boy speaks power. It speaks a great deal. Why? Because when you it's still, when you don't say the name, you rob him of his, a, a bit of his humanity. You make him ambiguous. You make him just another statistic, another number. You make his 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 traumatic event more palatable and and, and more easy to digest. Because when you call him a name, you have to admit he's human. You have to admit that he has a mom and a dad. You have to admit that he had some potential and promise at 11 years old. And I need to stop saying had because he's still alive. But um, And I'm really truly hoping he pulls through 100% recovery. But I've seen enough of these to know that the odds are not with him. But God, and, 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 and no matter how you view God, I'm not a religious person, but... I believe in God, and no matter how you view God, there are some things that transcend what human understanding uh, it, it, uh, encounters. And so, where I'm at right now is 
when I say that I'm drained. Now, I'm drained. I, I'm, I'm beat up right now. I, I'm just going to admit it, you know. Uh, one of the things I had to learn was it's okay to admit that you don't have the answers, all the answers. It's okay to admit that you need help. It's okay to admit that you're having a bad day. It's okay to admit that you are worn out. And I'm worn out right now. I'm worn out because I fight a battle so often, it feels alone. I've got people working with me, but they're looking to me. And when I don't have the answers and when I can't come through with resources, they're frustrated, they're hurt, they're disappointed. And the thing is, you start to look at the delusion of your expectations and say, what am I, what, 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 what's happening here? Now, with all that being said, I know me well enough to know that I'll wake up in the morning and I'll hit the ground running and I'll be on fire because that's what I do. But right now, it's kicking my ass because we have a lot. And the thing is, I wish this was an anomaly. I wish this was some one-off event that's so horrific and horrible that we, but it's not. It's happening in cities across America. We don't value our lives. We don't value the lives of others who look like us. And people say, well, you know, what's the problem? We have become so individualized. We have become so disjointed as a race that we can't see our collective need, our collective force, our collective potential. And so everybody's operating from an individual mindset. And people say, well, why is that a problem? We live in a society of social enclaves. That's why it's a problem. We live in a society of social enclaves where people thrive within the protection of their enclave and the support of their enclave. Latinos, Asians, Arabs, whites of all different uh, geographical backgrounds, but whites. And there's merging and mixing, but there is a specific protection within the enclave. And here's the problem. Blacks are not welcome in any of those enclaves. Even if you were to look in the LGBTQ community, Blacks aren't treated the same as everyone else and definitely not the same as whites. <clears throat> There's plenty of evidence and studies that show that there's racism and discrimination within the LGBTQ community. So nowhere we operate are we truly received and yet we won't receive and, and love on ourselves. That's a problem in a society where social enclaves are the place where you can find protection and support. Latinos are underwriting a massive wealth move. Asians have already done it. Asians have the highest earning median in the U.S. and they are rapidly closing the wealth gap between them and whites. They're almost at $100,000 per median household. They're in the upper 90s in, in median wealth. Whites are somewhere around 140, 147,000. Blacks are somewhere under 10,000, depending on you talking anywhere from 1,700 to 3,600 dollars. And it's because we have no unified approach. We have no collective economic uh, ideologies from which we operate. We have no economic agenda. We have no way of supporting programs. A projection I can't say, well, well, Doc, what's, what, what's the thing is, one of the things is people, when they get to a certain space, one of the things that I promised myself that I wouldn't do is I wouldn't allow my success to convince me that everything was okay. And so I, I made myself an agreement, as long as I remain an anomaly, that there are four more black men who have not experienced success and fluidity and opportunity in the way I have. And I'm not just talking money, I'm talking about the ability to make things happen for themselves and their families, regardless of how much money is in the bank account. Just being resourceful and being able to understand how to move and operate, then I haven't fulfilled my purpose. 
And so that's it. But what I'm saying, here's the problem. And we don't get it because we can't see beyond the moment. We're so busy living our best lives. Those of us who are doing okay, we're so busy living our best lives that we don't see what's happening. What's happening is this. If we don't create a better future, our children are going to suffer. Their children are going to suffer. And their children are going to suffer. Our grandchildren, our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. If you're my age, our grandchildren and up. Because our children are up and hopefully they've gotten enough of what we've given them that they're making some things happen. But here's the reality. We have done nothing to lay a foundation for our great-grandchildren to win. They're going to inherit probably a worse situation than we did. That's pitiful. That's shameful. We're not preparing young black males to go out into the world and be men. We aren't protecting young black girls so that they can be emotionally and spiritually whole. We are not holistically educating either young black males or young black females to become what they need in order to go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete but win. That's been my definition of educate for as long as I can remember and I've been trying to share it with you guys. At some point, we're going to have to reach a, 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 a conclusion that without one another, we will become uh, functionally irre irrelevant in about 12 years. At one point, they were saying 2038. I don't think it's going to take that long. We've already been surpassed as the largest minority. That belongs to the Hispanic community. And we are definitely not politically influential because we vote without thinking. We have a 90% loyalty regardless of who's in place to the Democratic Party who's done absolutely nothing for us but exploit us. We have no collective agenda in place to parlay the 1.4 trillion in cash flow that moves through the black community and out of it within a matter of six hours. We don't, we don't know how to circulate and support within the black community. We get paid and we're immediately spending into other economies and we don't understand it. We're sending our children to public school systems that literally are designed to exploit young black boys and to misdirect young black girls. I'm not going to get into the details of that. If you've paid attention to my videos, you know what I'm talking about. When I think about this little boy that's fighting for his life, little Johnson or whatever his first name is, or if Johnson is his first name, I don't know, but they just kept saying Johnson, Johnson. This young child targeted, is that a skating ring? It's, you know, is that a skating ring? And you know, you, you're there to have fun and be a kid. And now he's fighting for his life. And I wish that was the only time I have said that but it's not. We are going to have to come together. We're going to have to learn how to function. Or we're going to leave the next generation of our, our offspring, our progeny, a torrential rain of nothing but horror. And it will be on our hands because we have the knowledge, we have the wherewithal, and we have significant resources to at least start to make a dent in the problems we face. But it's too easy to say, oh my God, shaking my hand, that's horrible. That's a monster. All of these things, instead of saying, let's build something, let's do something, we have to do better. On that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. I am going to get my head together because I don't want to take this home. I don't want to take this home, so I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to try to get my head together.
I'll talk to you guys later. Don't forget, if you can, support the work we're doing. The, the links and everything is in the description box. I'm out of here.